let's 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 get uh, let's get started. I want I want to begin with a brief encouragement for all of you uh, as you read these Old Testament books, these Old Testament minor prophets, um, and other sections. Um, psalm one nineteen, big long psalm. Just want to read a portion to it. It says this: Oh, how I love your law! It's my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you've taught me. Listen to this. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Um, and that whole psalm, if you've not read it or it's been a while, is a, is a meditation from A to Z, from Aleph all the way to the end of the Hebrew alphabet. It goes letter by letter, meditating on um, the, 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 the scriptures and the gift that they are to us. And it's what we call the Old Testament, right? The, the, he's the, the writer of the, the psalm isn't writing about the New Testament. So he's just writing about the Old Testament. Of course, we, we know that Scripture is old and new. Um, and you may have favorite portions of Scripture that you love. Um, but what you're doing and what we're trying to do here is cultivate a love for the Scriptures. That we could say with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love this gift um, and I want to give just two quick bullet points to underscore, underscore this, pose a question, and then we'll jump into Habakkuk. Um, first of all, Jesus, just like the psalmist of 119, loved the scriptures. He loved them. He quoted them. He interpreted them. He shared them. And the scriptures that he loved was the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible. He didn't have the New Testament. So when Jesus is talking about and quoting the scriptures, he's quoting the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, and the, the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus, right? So if we understand the person of Jesus, the meaning of his life and, and his work, and we have the old scriptures, this was enough. That's enough to present to the Jews and the Gentiles a case for the salvation and the lordship of Jesus. Just want you to think about that. The Old Testament scriptures and the person and work of Jesus is enough to call people to faith. It's enough of the good news that they could understand and respond. Um, uh, with a quick examination, I just did cross-references reading through Habakkuk, the book we're going to jump into, and there's at least, I think, five direct quotes from Habakkuk in the New Testament. So the New Testament writers, their Bible is the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, so in, in uh, Acts 13, which we'll look at later, Luke 20, Jesus directly quotes it. Hebrews 10, Romans 1, Galatians 3, Revelation. These different books of the New Testament are looking back in our text today to Habakkuk. Um, and they're doing that all the time to, to the Old Testament scriptures. So, so to understand those quotes when they come up, you're reading along in Romans and and you come to this little quote, it's like, oh, that's weird, it's a quote. Go back to Habakkuk, you have to understand what they're bringing in their backpack, which is the Old Testament scriptures. They're bringing these texts that have meaning and have a context and a history and promises. And, and, and the New Testament writers are saying, you know that thing that we all know about? I'm, I'm applying it to what I'm, the argument I'm making. And so um, it's a great way to enrich our or reading, when you're reading in the Bible and those little cross-references, like, oh, why is, it says go to Isaiah, go back and read it, read around it, and it will enrich your understanding of the New Testament uh, arguments that are making. It's a great way to enrich your Bible reading, right? Just read through. Um, I, I hear people all the time, like, ah, the Old Testament's hard to understand. I can't, it's inaccessible. Like, why do we even do that? Like, just give me Jesus. It's like, well, if you love Jesus then you love the scriptures that Jesus loved. And guess what? He loved the Old Testament. He wasn't just like, well, I got to read it because, you know, I'm a good savior and I got to be a good example. No, he loved the scriptures. He immersed himself in them. Um, and, uh, and we should too. And so, yeah, it may be hard at first, 
But, you know, as you just read through it, you know, Habakkuk, it's three chapters. You can do it in a sitting. You know, just read through it, kind of get the big idea. And then you gather with others and get little bits here and slowly but surely you begin to build this view. Um, so here's a, maybe a challenge. Could you explain the gospel with your knowledge of Jesus and only the Old Testament? Could you do that if you had a friend? Would you know how to take them through the Old Testament scriptures to show them the beauty of Jesus? With your knowledge of Jesus, I'm not saying that you have to do that because we have the New Testament, right? The Gospels, the unpacking in the epistles. But could you just take your, you know, they, they make these little pocket New Testaments. What if they made pocket, why don't they make pocket Old Testaments? It's kind of weird, right? It's like, well, this is, so could you with your pocket Old Testament point people to Jesus? It's a good challenge. How would I explain all that Jesus fulfills, all the promises, from what I know of Jesus and the Old Testament? What are the scriptures I would go to? Because that's what the apostles did. They pointed back to the, the Old Testament scriptures and said, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. So this is all by way of a precursor to say your efforts in the Old Testament reading together are so worth it. And I hope you're being enriched and I'm challenging you that, that this is God's uh, hope for us that we would love all of the scriptures. Um, so that's all preamble. Uh, let me let me say a prayer and then uh, we'll jump into Habakkuk. Uh, Lord, thank you for this, the privilege we have to open up your word um, that is like honey to our lips. It's a, a burst of sweetness. It's a burst of uh, nourishment. And we pray that we would never discount any part of the Bible, but that you, by your spirit over time and reading and reflecting and having encouragement and conversation, that we would just uh, be, be more and more uh, amazed at the gift of your word, at the gift of your uh, wisdom for us. And I pray for the, the women here that you would deepen their love for you, and that from that, that you would also show them through the scriptures uh, just more of, of your beauty, and that they could live faithfully, as it says, we love to follow your ways your precepts, um, and that they give us wisdom uh, um, that we can't get anywhere else. So bless us this morning as we look at the scriptures together. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, So with the the time I have left, I want to uh, quickly just do an overview of Habakkuk really fast, a few like place, time, things, and then we'll just jump into the little portion today, um, the first 11 verses. So there's a, it's an oracle, that's kind of a interesting word, an oracle of the prophet Habakkuk. We don't know very much about Habakkuk. He was a prophet in the late, uh, or in the kind of 620 to 590 BC time, Um, and it's uh, written to the southern kingdom of Judah. So remember, there's the northern ten tribes and the southern uh, two tribes of of Judah. Um, An oracle, you know, is like, it's like a message from God through a prophet, So that he's speaking the words of God. Other, you know, civilizations claim to have oracles of God. Um, One of the, often the differences is that the oracles in scripture, in in the scripture, in our scriptures are, tend to be more clear and direct, like what he's saying. Uh, Other oracles and others, uh, you know, other cultures and lands kind of keep it open-ended, you know, so you kind of, you're confused and it could be this and it could be that. These tend to be a little more direct. Um, And remember, the northern ten tribes had been subdued in 722 B.C. So they're already, the the, the northern ten are just, you know, they've been decimated. They're being ruled. They don't have much going on with them. Um, And they were characterized by by wicked rulers um, as representatives of idolatrous and wicked people. So if you're reading about the Israel kingdom in the north, it's like, bad king, replaced by idolatrous king, replaced by evil king. (laughs) It it just goes on. There's never any real hope. Um, And one thing to remember is that that's that's through the lens of God, what God wants. So there were actually kings that were successful. Um, Ahab was an incredible builder. So he made lots of cities, and they're, they're finding stuff in the ground that he, he did that was lasting and, and impressive. So from a kind of a worldly perspective, 
yeah, maybe a, a great success. He built lots of things. He did, you know, made a name for himself. But, but God in Scripture just doesn't give him the time of day. He's wicked, idolatrous, does everything wrong. Um, so as, as we're thinking about this, we want to think through the lens of God's priorities versus the, the, the way of the world. So in some sense, he, people might say, oh, he was successful, but God says, no, he was wicked. So the, the northern kings, they're, they're, they're representative of unfaithful people, right? So as the king goes, so the nation goes. Um, whereas in the south, they had been oscillating between faithful and unfaithful. Faithful, unfaithful, 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 faithful, you know, true worshipers um, and then idol worshipers. Um, And so we come to this point in King Josiah, who was a faithful king, not perfect, but faithful. He was killed in a battle. And then his sons, Jehoaz and then Jehoiakim, you can read, um, we can read about them. I'm going to just grab a little section here in 2 Kings. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. 2 Kings 23, we're just going to read about these two sons of Josiah really fast. Uh, 2 Kings 23, 31 through 36. So uh, it says this, uh, Jehoaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. (laughs) uh, A very storied reign. His mother's name was Hamudal, and the daughter of Jeremiah and Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bonds at Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and talents of gold. So this guy, Egypt comes up and kind of takes him over. Uh, And then, and Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah, so it's the second son, king in the place of Josiah his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. So he he brings the one son to Egypt, puts another son in his place, and Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh. So he, he's requiring a, a tribute, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. So he, he doesn't take it from the treasury. He goes and steals it, takes it from the people. Uh, he exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land from everyone according to his assessment to give it to Pharaoh uh, Necho. I'm going through 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother was Zebedah, Zebedah the daughter of Padea of Ruma, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So it's putting them in line with those who were uh, idol worshipers, leading the people astray, um, hurting, hurting people. Um, so that's the context that Habakkuk's writing in. It's it's after a good king, these kind of bad kings that are putting stuff on the, the backs of their people. Um, he's writing um, uh, between 610 and 605 B.C. He's, he probably wrote this, they, they, they imagine. Um, and I'm trying to, what's the feel? Well, I was, do you remember a couple years ago when Russia amassed troops on the border of Ukraine? And we're hearing the news reports about that. It's like, there's more tanks. That's interesting. Like, and there's lots of people movement. And we were just watching what was going on. But nothing was happening. It was just this kind of movement. And you're, and, and you're just waiting. Like, are they actually going to do it or not? That's kind of the, the feel of this. Israel is this little country in the middle of the, the Babylonians up here, the Egyptians down here, these great, greater powers. And this little country is just going like, what are they going to be doing? What's going on? And today, right right now, Israel's massing troops at the edge of the Gaza Strip. And every, you know, every news report, like, they're going to go in. And, and you just don't know. That there's these movements, but this this tension, this moment of, of what's going to happen next. I think that's, that's the feel right here. As Habakkuk's writing, you've got this evil king. He's, you know paying off people on the backs of his people. They're not honoring God. They're idolatrous. Um, and there's these other nation states that are, that are right around there. Um, so it's not really a question of if, but when they're going to be attacked. And then the themes of the book are a cry for justice, justice for the people, a cry for, for people to return to, to God. The appointed time when God will act, there's a theme that God's going to act. That's going to come up uh, in our passage today, and it, it comes up again that God will act. And then there's a reminder to God's people 
in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of struggle, uh, to live by faith. Uh, so that maybe sets the stage for Habakkuk, um, kind of where we're at. Any, any questions, any thoughts on that? Anything that's popping in your mind? Okay, let's get into Habakkuk 1. If you have your Bibles, open up to Habakkuk. We'll just do the first 11. I've got uh, about 10 minutes, is that right? Okay, great. This will be perfect. Habakkuk, um, we're just going to do the first 11 verses. Um, The oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or, Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So I want you to do an experiment. Take one minute and share with someone at your table an injustice in the world that particularly galls you. Uh, an injustice in the world like that you particularly hate. So take one minute, share with one other person or a couple people one injustice that you particularly don't like right now. Go ahead. I'll call you back in a minute. All right, sorry to interrupt, but it's just a minute. What, what, what are some of the injustices? Just raise your hand and we'll holler out a few that, that you guys mentioned. Yeah, one right here. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. Yeah, galls you. You can't believe it. What else? Other, other injustices that, yep. Corrupt. Yeah, corrupt governments, particularly when you steal from those who need it and, and you know, line your own pockets or whatever. Yep, other, other things that gall you, injustices in the world. Okay, people that are, yep, protesting, that you feel like, oh, they shouldn't be protesting that. Other, other things that gall you. Yep. Exactly. Yep. You're just like, who's going to defend? Who's going to step in? Other other injustices that just get you. Ah, yeah. Criminals that get away with it, or just yeah. Yeah. Homeless. Yeah. Why? Why can't we? We're such a. I know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're kids. Why can't we take care of kids and protect them? Yeah, these are all, yeah. Any others? Racial Racial injustice, racial inequities, yep, across the globe, yep. Um, Look look at that Habakkuk 1, 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear, right? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. There's all this stuff going on. Why do you make me see iniquity? I see the problem. I see the, uh, and, and why do you idly look at wrong? 
Do you care? Do you care, God? Do you feel the, the cry of Habakkuk here? We feel that, that question. Um, I, <laughs> this is a personal story. It's, it's kind of funny now, but uh, when I was, I think, 17 or 18, I went, maybe I told this story before, but I went to this Chili's after a youth group with some friends, and we all hung out. And uh, it was, I don't know, 9.30 or 10. We were all leaving, so everyone kind of, you know, they scattered to their car, and I was with my friend Jason. And uh, I was walking. He had this little Geo Metro, this little, you remember those? They're like basically a, like a tuna can on wheels. And uh, so this little Geo Metro, I had a few adventures in that one, but this one, we're making our way to his car. He's going to bring me home, and this huge monster truck, right? Back in the uh, let's see, early 90s, people, like, they built these huge trucks, and they drive around, and they jack up the... So this truck comes in, you're kind of like, wow, that's a beast, that's cool. So it comes in, it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night through this parking lot, and it drives up, and we're just kind of standing there in the parking lot, and it drives up, like, right near me, and we're just kind of standing there, and uh, all of a sudden it stops, and I'm just standing there, and this guy jumps down out of the, out of the monster truck and runs towards me, and I'm kind of like... Um, um, just standing there, and he, he comes up, and he just clocks me in the chin and knocks me over. <laughs> just bam! And so I'm just, like, laid out on the ground, like, what happened? He, he turns around, runs back in the car, and just drives off. And uh, I will say, my, my desire for justice <laughs> and revenge, and, you know, we have these fight or flight or freeze responses. I think I'm a freeze first person. <laughs> It's not very strong or courageous, but it's just kind of what happens a lot of times. I kind of freeze, and I'm trying to think. So then we got into my friend. People said, oh, are you okay? I was fine, because I'm really tough. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got into the Geo Metro, and I'm sitting there in this little tuna can, and all of a sudden, the, the fight response followed after the freeze response, but there's no one there. So I am, like, shaking, and I want justice and I, I have no idea to this day whatever happened to this guy. I, I, I couldn't even see what he looked like. There's no recourse at all. And, and so, in a sense, you're just like, justice, don't you see? This is so wrong. Um, and, and there is no story of justice in there. It, 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 never, it never came. Um, but Habakkuk is, is kind of is crying out for justice for the people, crying out for God to show up. And, and he's crying out for faithfulness as well. Um, He's upset about the injustices in the land. It's, it's the corruption. We talked about that. It's the, the lack of concern for justice for people in the land, right? So the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. It's also a concern for the leadership to embody God's ways for the people. Because that's for the Jews. It's God's law, right? It's God's ways. And so Habakkuk's heart is yearning for God to say, Hold people accountable to, to right worship, to loving the Lord more than you love yourself, or for these false idols where you're giving your money and your concern away to the gods that can't, can't save. Um, and so maybe a question is, do we know God's concerns enough to be upset about them and to pray and ask for God's intervention? There's a call to, to prayer for God's ways in the world right here. We can, like Habakkuk, cry out to the Lord and say, how long? And say, do you see this? And say, this is my concern that is in line with your concern. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, the cry for justice in this first part. And then we have God's surprising answer. And there's just three little things I want to um, point out. I'm going to bring justice via your enemies is the first one. So Habakkuk, starting at verse 5, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So something unexpected is going to happen. And he says, this is what it is. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians in the north, that bitter and hasty nation. So God has no love for the Babylonians who march through the breadths of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome their justice and dignity go forth from themselves 
Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on them. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. Remember, violence was in that first line. Oh, cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Well, the violence of the, the, the bad kings and rulers in Judah is going to be met with the violence of the Chaldeans. Um, they all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. So it says, uh, at, at kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. That's talking about siege ramps, right? They just encircle you, and they build ramps just to come right into the city. It's talking about those, and you can see those today. If you go to Israel, there's siege ramps that's, you know, thousands of years old that they're, uh, at the time Romans built, but before that, the Babylonians um, and then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Ooh, guilty men whose own might is their God. So he says, I'm going to bring justice, but it's going to be in an unexpected place, and you're not going to like it because it's coming from your enemies. It's like, ah, oh, maybe I didn't. Uh, and then God will bring ultimate justice. Look at verse 11, and this will come up later as well. Habakkuk will raise this like, can you really use the Chaldeans whose own might is their God, right? And so that's not going to hold because they should be worshiping the true God. They should, the Chaldeans should turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, um, and so there's going to be a judgment on the Chaldeans as well. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. God will raise up someone to, to punish or to chasten Israel. And then they're, of course, wicked as well. And so God will, punishes them as well. Um, so uh, God's going to bring ultimate justice. And then three, the gospel is the antidote to our cry for justice because it transforms us, because it frees us, and it's the fulfillment of these promises. So this is just looking forward, and I wanted to pull one scripture from the New Testament, even though we're loving the Old Testament. And the reason why is because Paul quotes this exact passage. He quotes uh, verse 5. Um, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. And he's telling the story of the gospel and showing how Jesus uh, is the fulfillment of all the promises of God, how God, someone would be raised up and then God replaces that person. Someone uh, will, uh, so for instance, King Saul is replaced by King David. And, and it goes on, and Jesus is replacing the old way. He's the fulfillment of all of the, the scriptures. And so he uses this passage to warn his Jewish listeners. He leads up to Jesus, and then he quotes this, looking back that God will judge them. And if, you, if you're just reading this in the New Testament, you're like, oh, God's going to do a great thing. It's so good news. Ah, but we love the Old Testament. We love the scriptures that Jesus loved. And you go back and you realize what Paul's doing is saying, a huge warning. Look out. If you don't turn to Jesus, there will be judgment, just as there, the, Judah was judged in the time of Habakkuk. So come to Jesus, who is the fulfillment, who is that road to freedom, who is that road to forgiveness and redemption, who is the promised Messiah. Don't miss out, because there is going to be a day when God will ultimately judge. And he goes back to Habakkuk in this little moment right here. So as you're reading together, as you're talking together, be looking for these themes of justice and the themes of God's actions at certain moments in time, because uh, he will uh, answer our prayers for justice. Uh, he promises that. You know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's why we don't have to interject ourselves and solve everything. We can trust him and, and let the law of love lead how we interact but god will bring his justice in time and then faith which you'll pick up later on um the the antidote for skepticism would be faith yeah oh this was acts uh 13 i think verse 41 he quotes it directly but i would encourage you because it's a sermon that paul's preaching in a synagogue uh so he he does a whole uh discussion of the gospel going through uh, uh the history of god's people and then it's near the end that he, he warns them. So that, that's a great, it'll take you two minutes, but you get a, a, a real, actually, he would be a great, this is a great example how to point people to the gospel using the Old Testament. Paul does it right there for you. So you can take a lesson from him. Um, so um, any, any other questions or thoughts, things that are popping? 
in your mind. Okay, I think my time is done. So can I pray for you? And uh, if stuff comes up, feel free to email or, you know, because each time we read through this, we learn a little bit more. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. So um, your thoughts will encourage and strengthen my understanding as well. Lord, thanks for this time together. Um, and uh, I wish I could sit for several hours at each of these tables and we could uh, share together both what you're doing in our life, what we see in the passage, we could study. Um, but I pray that you bless this time of study, of discussion, of prayer, and deepen our love for you, for your word, and for one another. And we pray from that place that we could be uh, ambassadors of good news in the world, sharing uh, in both word and deed um, the love that we've received, the forgiveness, the hope, uh, and uh, the faith that we have because of you and by your spirit. So bless this time, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.